All right, if I could get everybody's attention, please. I'd uh, like to start off by thanking you all for coming. Uh, welcome to Struggles of Addiction. Uh, your presence here alone is proof that our community has maintained strength and heart despite this growing epidemic that continues to ravage our community. Tonight we will hear from those who have loved ones struggling with addiction and from the medical professionals on what they are seeing in the hospitals. Tonight is the second of a five-part lecture series to educate parents and other adults in our community about the dangers of opioid addiction right here in our home of Washington County. This is a cooperative effort of the West Bend Rotary Club, Elevate, Moraine Park Technical College, and the Washington County Heroin Task Force. This series is designed to complement the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit, which we do encourage you to visit later this evening. More details on additional lectures and the Hidden in Plain Sight exhibit will be given at the conclusion of this event. Our first two speakers tonight are both inpatient pharmacists at a hospital over in Appleton. They both grew up in Wisconsin and have witnessed the devastating impact that drugs have on the lives of them and their families firsthand. It is my privilege to introduce our first speakers, Holly Mercado and Carly Camps. Good evening, everyone. My name is Holly, and this is Carly. And today we will discuss with you some of the examples of how heroin has impacted our practice and our jobs in healthcare. Okay, so first I'll start by going over some statistics. So 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose, and this includes prescriptions and illegal forms of opioids. And I think that's important to point out that uh, people we care about and people we love are not just passing away from illicit substances, these are actual prescribed medications as well. Another interesting statistic that I found was that in the past 18 years, the amount of prescriptions sold has quadrupled. However, people are not reporting an increase in pain. So that means that we are over-prescribing for our patients, but yet the pain remains the same. Throughout our presentation, you may hear us speak of scheduled medications. So I just wanted to give you an example of what these scheduled medications are. So our first schedule medications um, are medications that are the highest addiction risk. They have no accepted medical use. This would be examples like heroin or meth. And then as you go further down the schedule um, and further down the table, you'll see that the risk of abuse actually decreases. So schedule five would have the lowest risk of abuse. So this graph shows that um, why we're here. So as you can see with the blue line, um, heroin deaths is increasing greatly um, as the years go by. But I wanted to point out that deaths from any opioids, the top green line, has also been greatly increasing. So this is a problem with our prescription drugs as well. Uh, nationwide, looking at the map, you can see um, how, depending on where you live, you may have greater access to opioid prescriptions. So as you can see, Wisconsin is somewhere in the middle. We have about 72 to 82 opioid prescriptions per 100 people. So that's still a lot of opioid prescriptions, about 80% of the population. And this last graph um, shows where people who are abusing opioids get access to their medications. So the gray column is the most common, and as you can see, it's they obtain their opioids from a friend or a relative for free. Um, the second most common type of way people obtain opioids for abuse would be getting it prescribed by one or more physicians. And that is something called doctor shopping that we will talk about later towards the end. So now I'm gonna focus, is this on? Can you guys hear me? Okay, so now I'm gonna focus um, on our specific experience that um, we've had in the hospital. So the first thing I'm going to talk about are codes. So um, we actually have a lot of codes at the hospital that we're at um, from uh, people uh, abusing medications or illicit substances. So I'm going to tell you specifically about one that kind of touched both of us. Um, it was a younger guy. He was, I think, early 30s, I think is what he was. Um, but he came in, and they actually had to cut all of his clothes off because um, he had overdosed on heroin, and he had lost control of his... Um, bowels in his bladder, and he actually um, had vomited too on the way 
um, over to the hospital. Um, and then again, um, while he was there, he was given Narcan or Naloxone. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that, but basically what it does is when patients take heroin, um, this Narcan goes in and immediately takes the heroin out of the receptors in the brain. So it's an immediate effect and you, they basically patients lose that high, like not that long after they're given Narcan. So patients tend to wake up very angry and this patient specifically woke up and tore his IV lines out and started trying to walk out of the emergency room. So often the last point on here is that patients usually leave AMA, which means that they leave against medical advice. So insurance companies often don't cover those stays because um, the patients kind of make that own, their own choice to leave. Uh, also another thing that we've seen in codes with drug overdoses is that patients are often intubated, which basically means they can't protect their own airway. And I don't know if you guys know what that means, but um, they put a tube down their throat and the patients are supported by a machine to breathe. Um, another thing that we do at our hospital, we have an adolescent um, behavioral health unit. Uh, it's usually about 13 to 17 year olds. And we talk to them uh, every week on Fridays and just kind of have a discussion about medication safety and drugs, um, marijuana, cocaine, uh, caffeine, all kinds of stuff. Um, so common themes that we've seen are family members or significant others as examples that these um, patients have used. Uh, otherwise, the influence of friends is a pretty big thing um, dealing with peer pressure. Um, it has been easy for them to obtain illicit substances. And actually, last week when we were doing it, we kind of got in a little feud with the, with the patients that were out there because they were telling us that, well, if my drug dealer is doing the same drug with me, it's got to be safe, right? Because they wouldn't do it if it wasn't safe. So I think the biggest point there is that um, no one really knows what's in the substance that they're doing. They can say that's what it is, but we don't actually truly know what's in it. So I think that is like one of the biggest risks. Um, also, there's a lack of education on dangers because people usually think, oh, this is never going to happen to me. This isn't going to happen to anyone I know. It's a rare thing. So I think that's a big thing that people should be more aware of too. All right, so now I'll talk about um, the impact we see of drug abuse um, on the hospital and healthcare systems. So the emergency rooms statewide have seen an increase in visits related to overdoses. So from July of 2013 to June of 2016, there were a total of 5,200 ER visits statewide. So the map that I've included on the slide um, shows the prevalence of ER visits per county. Um, so I circled Washington County in yellow so we can kind of see how we compare to the rest of the state. Cost is always a major factor for our patients and for our hospitals. We try to provide um, the best possible care to our patients. So data from July of 2015 to June of 2016 shows that the median charge for an ER visit related to a drug overdose is about $2,000. For patients admitted to the hospital for substance abuse, leaving against medical advice, or have, as Carly talked about, leaving AMA, can cost the patient anywhere from $7,000 to $15,000. Now, I don't have um, a reason for why the wide gap and why the wide price range, but I think it's probably just because of the different things that and the different measures that they do at each hospital. However, I, again, I wanted to reiterate that a lot of times leaving against medical advice the patients have to pay for that cost out of pocket. And a lot of our patients, unfortunately, that we see that are there for drug abuse um, do leave AMA, and I don't think they realize um, how expensive that trip is going to be for them. So another um, big issue we see in the hospital are infections. So obviously there's a huge risk with needle sharing, and I think that's a pretty uh, common idea that people know that when you share needles and you have the bacteria from one person's skin and you insert it into your own, that is a big risk for infection. Um, so the top picture of the patient's arm is showing what cellulitis is. So cellulitis is infection of the skin and tissue underneath the skin. This is a very common problem in our IV drug user population. So they may think even by using their own needles and repeatedly using their own needles and not sharing that they're not going to be at risk for this um, infection. However, 
unfortunately, a lot of patients clean their needles inappropriately. So we had one patient specifically who I remember stood out because she was in the hospital frequently for recurring cellulitis, and we could not get it to go away. And we asked her, you know, are you sharing needles? And she, she absolutely refused. She was not sharing needles. However, when we asked her how she was cleaning her needles, she was licking them. And so the mouth is one of, you know, the dirtiest places on your body. So then she was inserting this into the bloodstream that is normally a sterile environment or free of bacteria. So um, huge risk for infection here. And then um, patients don't realize that cellulitis actually can spread. So it might start just by a little red area on your arm, but without treatment that can actually spread into the bloodstream. And we all know that blood is pumped through our heart. So the bottom picture is um, a picture of heart valves. So your, inside your heart are little valves um, that help the blood flow. And these little valves are a really good place for bacteria to get stuck on. And without, you're not gonna see any symptoms of um, the bacteria being stuck on your heart valve. So before you know it, the valve could be dead and could not function anymore. And I've actually seen IV drug users need open heart surgery to get a replacement valve and need um, to have to be on medications for the rest of their life. So that's kind of one extreme as far as um, healthcare goes. But even so, even if they just get the bloodstream or infection or the cellulitis, you're still looking at six to eight weeks of IV antibiotics. And that's more money, and more time spent that interrupts your life and keeps you away from school and work. So now I'm gonna focus on some laws and regulations. Um, so the pers we have a prescription drug monitoring program, which is the PDMP. Um, it currently is only it's in 49 states in Missouri is the only state right now that doesn't have an active PDMP. So basically what it is, it's a statewide electronic database which collects um, data on substances dispensed in the state. So every time a patient or anyone goes to like a CVS or a Walgreens and picks up um, any kind of the scheduled medications, it's gonna, the, the data from that is gonna transfer to this database so anyone um, can access it. So when patients are admitted to the hospital, one of the steps that we do is we look at it and see when's the last time patients got it. Um, we look at a couple of things that I'll discuss in a little bit, but basically what it is, it's designed to monitor for abuse or diversion. So in Wisconsin, it started in 2013, and I don't know if you guys remember, so it schedules two through five that Holly talked about earlier. Um, so Wisconsin laws, valid ID required to pick up um, any one of these scheduled medications. Controlled substance record may be submitted by about midnight of the next business day after the drug is dispensed from the pharmacy. And a practitioner must review each patient's PDMP record before the practitioner issue, issues a prescription order for the patient, just to make sure that they aren't doctor shopping or getting multiple prescriptions. So what it does is it helps alert providers to the high total doses frequent early fills or taking more than prescribed, uh, prescriptions from multiple providers, which is doctor shopping, or providers frequently prescribing narcotics. It also monitors the physicians too. It's not just monitoring the patients, it's monitoring the physicians because if this physician's like giving 95% of their patients um, narcotics, it's obviously gonna be flagged. Um, also, a new feature to this program is drug interactions. Uh, it only does the ones that are listed on each patient's profile on the PDMP, but um, multiple different uh, categories of medications can have additive effects, and it can increase the risk for um, overdosing. Um, and then it also goes through other non-monitored substances, too. And I'm going to share a story when I started. My first job when I started in pharmacy was actually at a retail setting, and I was just I would worked for maybe like a year, so I was just a student. And um, we had a patient come in from the ED and they had a prescription written for Vicodin and it said number 10, take as needed or whatever. And the patient, before they brought it to us, put another zero at the end. So it looked like they were getting a prescription from the ED for 100 tablets, which is a huge red flag for us. So luckily um, the pharmacist I was working with caught it and actually caught the cops on the patient because that is illegal to forge prescriptions. So this is kind of what um, 
on our site of the PDMP looks like. So you type in the first name, last name, date of birth, zip code, um, and then you can filter which states you want to look at. So here, commonly, we look at like Iowa and Illinois and Minnesota, close ones. And then this is kind of what it looks like. So it brings up a huge map, and then it shows which pharmacies the patient has been to, and it shows their most recent address. And then the last thing it shows is, like I was telling you, with all the different medications that the patient has picked up. So it goes through each drug, the what quantity they got, um, and then the associated amount of day supply that they should be using, when it was prescribed, when it was dispensed from the pharmacy, um, and then any, if there's any refills at all. So something that we can use um, when patients come into the hospital too. Okay, so the last thing we'll talk about today is doctor shopping. Um, so the definition of doctor shopping, a patient obtaining a controlled substance from multiple healthcare practitioners without their knowledge. So a lot of people just think, you know, I'm just looking for my medication, I'm in pain, or looking for that high, and they don't realize that this is actually a federal crime. So on average, across the United States, it can be punishable by up to five years of jail time or $5,000 worth of fines. Some clues that your loved one may be doctor shopping or someone you know, um, if they have similar prescriptions from different doctors. So if you notice multiple pill bottles and they're all for a very similar pain medication, you might wonder, how did they get those? Or why do they have so many similar meds treating the same problem? If they pay for a doctor visit or medications with cash, even though they have insurance. So um, unfortunately, we see this a lot with patients trying to circumvent the system. They think, oh, I just got my oxycodone filled. It was a 30-day supply. The insurance will not cover another oxycodone fill. Um, so they think paying with cash, they'll kind of get around it. However, now with the PDMP that Carly spoke of, uh, that will alert us if they had just gotten a fill for a similar medication. So that um, puts a stop to that. Seeing a doctor in a different city is also a sign that the patient is doctor shopping. Oftentimes, um, if something is inconvenient for the patient, if they have to travel far distances or if they have to wait a long amount of time, that can be a sign that they're doctor shopping or they're using the healthcare system inappropriately. And then lastly, asking for a medication by drug name and dose. So oftentimes, um, non-healthcare providers are not necessarily familiar with names of pain medications or specific doses or routes. So if we have a patient who walks into the emergency room and says, I would like hydromorphone, four milligrams IV, and they name these drug names, that's often a red flag that, okay, maybe they're not actually using this medication as they should be. So that is it for our presentation. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions or not. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so one thing I didn't mention with the PDMP, it shows up any single pharmacy. If it, if the internet if, No, that does not show up. Yeah, that does not show up. It's only when you, uh, you go to a pharmacy and that is dispensed. That's the only time it'll it'll be linked on there. So that is a fault, I think, of the system. Oftentimes, medications bought online are from out of the country. So... Um, they're not necessarily seen by like United States healthcare providers. Yes. Is there a way that someone could get a, a new needle? Is there like a needle exchange or something? There I mean, is a needle exchange program um, that has, I'm not, I can't speak to it. Unfortunately, I apologize. Um, I know some pharmacies um, will uh, provide needles, but it depends on the pharmacist and their level of comfort with dispensing that, um, but I am aware that you can you can get clean needles. I just don't have the exact answer for you. I apologize. I think that's where the controversy comes um, with the pharmacist. I've been in multiple retail settings where patients will come in asking about that, um, but the, usually the pharmacist does refuse it that I've seen, at least personally, um, because of that risk, because they don't want it's kind of a hard, like a rock in a hard place. So you don't want people using medic, like using drugs, but you also don't want them using bad needles. So it's kind of like 
where the controversy goes. I think a lot of times uh, pharmacists are aware that the drug abuse is going to happen um, regardless, and um, it's just each person's opinion, mm -hmm. you know, if my patients, and I want them to be using safe, clean needles. You might not be able to stop the drug abuse, but at least you can make sure that that patient is safe and is using best practices and clean needles. Yeah, and another thing, usually if that's the case, what they'll have is the, they'll have the patient sign something that says that they are picking up the needles. Um, the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin does come to Washington County on a monthly basis so and does have a mobile van that they will do needle exchange and testing in our county. So if you wanted more information, you could check with the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin. Thank you. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you say it's a federal crime and people are going to go to jail. Who's prosecuting? Because this problem seems to continue. Um, a lot of people are blaming the doctors. Is there any legislation that's happening that's going to start enforcing some of this? Um, right now, to the best of my knowledge, from what I did find on doctor shopping, um, the laws are federal laws. So um, I think the most we do is we can contact our local police department um, and kind of alert them. But the PDMP is actually accessible to um, local law enforcement, so they can also access the information on the law. So we can contact the um, police department and make them aware and have them handle it. So I have a friend who's continued in the system for over three years. She gets her drugs online and she's doctor shopped. She's gotten kicked out of every rehab there is and uh, there seems to be no recourse whatsoever. Her family cannot put her in and uh, she can walk out freely. None of this is working, in my opinion. Have you, um, not you personally, but something to consider too would be um, getting, contacting that provider, your friend's provider. And even though there's HIPAA and there's laws between um, what a patient can, uh, or what a provider can tell you about a patient, I think alerting someone um, who's ever prov providing and prescribing the medications that there may be potential for abuse is, um, would be really important to help your friend. That's the most you can, I mean, one way that you can help to kind of stop that problem. Holly and Carly for those sobering statistics and stories. And I, I do want to mention all these speakers will be out in that lobby area after the program. You can uh, ask them questions. And uh, we also do have a question box out there to the right of that door if you have any private questions that perhaps you are not comfortable sharing in a large group setting. Our next speaker is... Uh, at the heart of a lot of prevention programs here in our community. Jessica Goddard Geschke is a certified clinical substance abuse counselor. She received a bachelor's of science and human service from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and an associate's degree in AODA from right here, Rain Park Technical College. She is the director of AODA services at Affiliated Clinical Services here in West Bend. Over eight years, experience working with and supervising medication-assisted therapy programs. Um, that includes use of Suboxone and Vivitrol. She helps to bring a face and voice to recovery and, and the stigma associated with those affected by addiction through her community organization involvement, including uh, Rise Together. Uh, there's the Washington County Heroin Task Force, uh, Washington County Heroin Initiative Program, Wisconsin Voices for Recovery, Wisconsin United We Can, Worldwide United We Can, Project Second Start, Wisconsin RAP, and SCAODA. So there are a lot of programs in place addressing these issues. I think the biggest problem comes from, though, uh, you can send someone to rehab, give them all the resources they can need to recover, but their heart has to be in it. And I think that is the heart of the issue here. 
Jessica co-founded Wisconsin Siblings United Support Group as she is the sister of a person struggling with the disease of addiction. So um, as well as being a staunch supporter of the prevention, it has hit very close to home for her. Jessica also volunteers her time on a state level by holding positions as AODA Advisory Committee member of Marine Park Technical College of Wisconsin, the Heroin Task Force Treatment Subcommittee Chairleader, and uh, the Wisconsin State Representative for Facing Addiction and the Wisconsin Coalition for Prescription Drug Abuse Reduction Coalition. So certainly uh, well qualified to speak to us all up here. We are very appreciative that she spent so much free time uh, bringing this awareness to our community. So with, without further ado, I present to you Jessica Gashki. All right, that was a lot of an introduction. Thank you, but not needed. You don't need to say all that for future reference. <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys for coming out tonight, um, and thank you to everyone who um, put this whole thing together for us. So like he said, my name is Jessica Geschke. Goddard is my middle name. I'm not sure where you got that from. My middle name, my maiden name. Um, but I am the president of Stop Heroin Now and everything else that's listed up there. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go ahead and get through this PowerPoint because I want to make sure I give Tyler time to speak tonight. All right, so... Um, I've been asked to speak tonight on a few different things, so I'm going to try my best to incorporate all of my roles into one um, in about 20 minutes. I typically speak as a therapist or an activist or as a sibling of a person in long-term recovery. So speaking on all three at once tonight may be a little bit challenging for me. Um, please also bear with me as, again, I am a therapist, not a public speaker. I am the president of Stop Heroin Now. We're based right here out of... Um, in Wisconsin. Our mission is to educate the community, families, and individuals about the disease of addiction for improved services and access for services of all those affected by this disease. So to sum that up, our goal is just to help everyone and anyone get the treatment that they deserve. Our organization was founded in 2013 by Linda Lentz after she lost her son Tony to an accidental heroin overdose after he celebrated just one year of sobriety. Linda felt that it was um, important for her to do something on a bigger scale to bring other mothers and fathers of lost loved ones together and Stop Heroin Now was born. Two years ago, Linda asked me to take over this organization. I began Transforming, which was once an online support group for parents, holding more than 900 moms and dads in this state who had lost a child to the, to the disease of addiction into a statewide resource and database for treatment, education, and prevention. We currently co-host the largest recovery coach network in the state and fund more than 20 people a year into sober living, treatment, and recovery coaching needs. We do interventions, offer support group daily to parents, siblings, and the person struggling with the disease of addiction on a daily basis. The question I get most often is, how do I pay for all that? Well, I do a ton of fundraising and ask for donations. We co-host rallies, concerts, sober events around the state to raise money for treatment and education. We hosted one of these rallies right here in West Bend um, this past summer. And then we followed it up in September by co-hosting the statewide Rock into Recovery rally at the state capitol with John Nigren. We also partner with the Heroin Task Force of Washington County um, during the 4th of July and we marched in two parades right here in Washington County. We hosted um, a Stop Heroin rally in Dodge County. We raised more than $7,000 over there for treatment needs. We accept any and all donations, big and small, towards our cause. We have families that host yearly events that raise money for our organization as well, such as the Terry Fritz Golf Memorial outing, the Jay Memorial outing, and new this Labor Day, Packer to Packer, where a man in long-term recovery will be walking from Lambeau Field all the way down to Cudahy in hopes to wait, raise awareness and monies for Stop Heroin Now. We are meeting with some pretty important people in our state and country to bring about change, to be the voice of, to the voiceless, and to make sure that individuals understand that they are not alone in this fight. We are here and that we are stand str standing strong in this epidemic.
In 2000, or October of 2015, we attended the national rally in Washington, D.C. It was a pretty big deal for my team and I. We met with the police chief from Massachusetts who's making headline news. We celebrated 15, or 13 excuse me, years of sobriety with our team member and Vice President Katie during the Unite to Face Addiction Rally. And I marched in my first ever prote protest against the FDA right, against, um, right up to the White House. So I'm honored to be here tonight in West Bend. While Stop Heroin Now is statewide, I work close by, just a couple blocks away, and I live in Horicon where I'm raising my family. Having an event like this means people, my people, all of you, are getting your hands on the resources that you need. That you are getting the help you deserve and our community is coming together to become part of the solution. I am a substance abuse therapist at Affiliated Clinical Services. As the director of AODA services there, I am involved daily in my patients' lives. We run an intensive outpatient program at ACS. I believe it's to be one of the best. We believe in treating the whole family, not just the person struggling with the disease. We have a tailored treatment program around this concept, um, and I believe it works. A number of the groups are listed on the screen. If you want more information about that, you can ask me when we're done. Working at ACS, I have learned to deal with the death of my patients, because as we all know, this disease will kill you if it's left untreated. There was a flyer that the DOJ put out last year that stated every 19 minutes, someone in America dies from an overdose. Every 19 minutes. A new study came out that every four minutes in America, someone dies from, this, um, from their addiction, regardless of what that addiction is. Opiates, alcohol, cocaine, meth. Tonight, as I was sitting out there in the lobby with Rana talking about the presentation, we overheard on the news that 91 people die in America from opiate overdoses per day, 91. That 10 million people are in need of treatment and only 11% of those people that are struggling get that help that they need. 11% of 10 million. I continue to believe and now know that education and treatment are our best ways out of this epidemic. It has been concluded that incarcerating our way out has failed. And what I mean by that is that we cannot continue to arrest our way out of this addiction for nonviolent crimes and toss people away in some jail cell, offering little to no treatment for the very disease that created the criminal thinking to begin with, and expect some result to happen and that prison or jail will cure them, because it doesn't work. It has failed, and they will continue to be addictive in nature and seek addictive drugs as a means to cope when they get out. It seems simple because studies have reported that for every dollar invested in education and treatment, we save $11 in the criminal justice system and the medical cost. An estimated 52 million people have used prescription drugs at least once in their lifetime for the heck of it because it was fun, because someone gave it to them. One in five teens are abusing prescription painkillers, and in that fact, one in 12 high school seniors reported non-medical use of Vicodin. One in 20 teens reported abusing Oxycontin, and of that, 14% met criteria for dependency. 14%. That's a scary number to me because that means that there are 14% of teens out there under the age of 18 who are already labeled as drug addicts. More people in the United States died today from accidental prescription drug overdoses than from motor vehicle accidents and gun violence combined. One in 15 people who try non-medical prescription painkillers will try heroin within the next 10 years. If I had a dollar for every patient who came into my office and told me, as an opiate addict, that using Oxycontins or Perk 30s, I will never go to heroin. I'd be a very rich woman. So when I stand up here and I spout out all these numbers to you, it's not to be looked at as a scare tactic. It's just a fact. And for those of you who are parents in this room, I hope it sinks in. Because starting that key, or conversation is key early with your kids. Almost nine out of 10 kids that smoke um, will continue smoking after they turn 18, if they start it before age 10. Many kids start using tobacco by age 11 and they're addicted by age 14. By the time children are in eighth, eighth grade, 46% of them think that using alcohol is okay. There have been reports that kids who are um, age 13 already think that using drugs like marijuana or prescription pain relievers are cool. I myself did an intake a 
few months back on a 12-year-old who came into our clinic in West Bend with track marks. My kid's 11, and I couldn't. I, I just went home and cried that night. He was 12. So I urge you as parents to not allow your kids to drink with you. Do not allow them to consume alcohol until they're 21. Do not allow them to smoke cigarettes. If you know that they are smoking weed, get them treatment. Experimenting with drugs can lead to addiction. I mean, that is, after all, why we are here tonight, right? Why we have built this amazing bedroom down the hall and filled it with drugs and alcohol for all of you to see and be educated on. To educate ourselves, the public, on the dangers of these drugs and drinking and what they can do to our youth. And when we talk about our youth, I have a special reason for educating them and I, the reason I fight this fight. I'm a mom. And my, fight, my reason for fighting this fight is simple. <clears throat> these two amazing kids right here on the screen. Every day I wake up, I get them out of bed, ready for school, and send them off. And I go to work, and I spend most days feeling as if I'm walking through an endless shadow of death and despair. I see so much pain, heartache, and sorrow on a daily basis in this job that I feel like when I get home at night, I look at these two tiny faces and I crumble into a million pieces. Some nights after I have lost a patient to an overdose or a suicide, I hold these kids so close that it hurts my heart because I know that that patient was someone else's kid. That patient was someone's father or mother, brother or sister. I watch some, my kids play Uno on the floor in my living room, and I fear for their future. Because not only is addiction a disease, but it's one that runs in my family. It runs in their dad's family, so they're predisposed to it. And because doing drugs at a young age, in middle school, high school, it's become the social norm. I know this, but I can do something about it. So allowing my kids to drink alcohol um, with an adult prior to 21 or allowing them to smoke at a young age is dangerous and ultimately increases their odds that they might develop some sort of dependency, and I'm not going to allow it. The longer we keep our youth alcohol and drug free, the better chance we have at never allowing them to become dependent upon substances. So now you've met my kids. And I know what you're thinking. So she does this for a living because of them. Yep, that's part of it. But long before they came in my life, I was just an everyday therapist living in the quiet town of Horicon. My only hope was to make enough money to support my husband and I because we all know being a therapist, you don't make a lot of money. You don't go into this field for that. And maybe my wildest dream was to go to Florida someday and swim with the dolphins. Those were the quiet, peaceful days. I call them the calm before the storm. Addiction is a family disease. It's not one that only affects the person struggling with the, the addiction, but it affects everyone that it touches. My brother's addiction has engulfed all of us. I have turned the pain, the pain of watching one of the most important people in my life struggle down the path of destruction, and I've turned it into something beneficial. My brother's addiction to opiates and heroin and his road to recovery have been a motivator for me. I pretty much do everything I can to be a part of change in this community. As was said earlier, I started a support group for other people like me, siblings of those who want support for the, for the addiction of their sibling. I sit on the Washington County Heroin Task Force, the advisory boards for multiple things. But I do all this because I need to. I need to continue to fight for you, for me, for my brother, for all of us for purpose, for recovery, for change. My hope is that by sharing information, education, my story with others, we can change and shape the future. We can breathe hope back into the hopeless to show the affected family member's side of addiction, but in turn, give inspiration to others that there is life within addiction and sobriety. Addiction affects one-third of American households, and I am one of those people of the one-third and I'm blessed tonight to share my story with you. Don't laugh at that picture. So I am not an opiate addict, but I do love one very, very much. There were some days that I honestly believed that I loved him more than he loved himself. It was on those days that I had to remind myself to take a step back as his sister, put on my therapist hat, as hard and as selfish as I thought that was. 
my younger brother is a person struggling with the disease of addiction. My brother's addiction has created many, many years of ups and downs, successes, and relapses. I know as a therapist, I can't change him. I can't fix his disease. I can't make it all go away. I can't save him. One of the most humbling experiences I have ever had to have was to watch him get clean and not be able to help. Addiction's like a cancer that affects every member of the family. I once heard a member of an addict say, if my child had cancer, we'd be having a fundraiser for him. But instead, it's something we have to tuck away in our hearts and hide in fear of judgment. I guess we all have our own way of dealing with the disease. I know I have dealt with it in ways that were unhealthy for me, such as shutting down, ignoring the signs, and pretending that addiction itself no longer exists. But I have also had to make a choice now to be a solution maker. I'm the second oldest of four children, and I'm the only girl. When I was seven years old, my parents decided to adopt a child from Korea. I remember feeling overjoyed with the experience, and from the moment my brother entered our family, I took on the role of a second mom to him. At seven, I did not understand that prior to him coming to America, he had been placed in an orphanage for the first three years of his life. I did not understand that his parents gave him up because they could not afford him, and because of this, he would have abandonment issues later on in his life. I did not understand that my parents knew little to nothing about his birth parents, and because of this, the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction was widespread in his genes and went unknowingly uncovered for years. What I did know was that I had a perfect brown-skinned, brown-eyed, laughing baby brother who I loved unconditionally and would do anything in this world for. At age 13, things began to change for him. That smile that was once so radiant was no more. It was as if he was haunted by something he could not explain. He got drunk that year for the first time at a friend's house. My mother and father took him to the hospital, and I met them there. And I remember the doctors, they were running around him, hooking tubes up to him, plugging things into him. And I thought at that moment that he might die. And at age 18, that was the hard realization for me to withstand. It was in that moment that I felt extreme guilt for the first time. I began to think that I had failed him in some way, shape, or form. I was supposed to protect him from things like this, so how could I, his big sister, have let this happen to him? The if-onlys and should-haves ran through my young 18-year-old head, and I began to feel helpless. My brother was lucky, and he did pull through. After a few days when he was discharged from the hospital, we discovered that he had been smoking pot. He later admitted to dealing it to all the kids in school, and he will tell you that he was a master con artist in the making. I remember him stealing money from my parents, selling his stereo for drugs, sneaking out of the bedroom late at night, and doing unthinkable things like even having a gang break into our house. The list goes on. As a person or as a sister of a person struggling with the disease of addiction, I have spent every moment fighting the disease of this addiction with him that he has allowed me to. There were many months I spent what I felt like every hour or even second of my life trying to protect him from his own death. Even now, to think back on those days, it makes me sick to my stomach. Those were some pretty, pretty dark days. I was a mere broken image of what you see standing here today. I would wake up every morning in fear, so deep down to my core, that I felt as if I couldn't breathe and I myself wondered if I was dead. I would have to take a deep breath and realize that another night had happened, another night that I did not get that call. You know, the one where somebody that I don't know tells me that my brother is dead. I feared that phone. I never wanted it to ring. I wish I could stand here and tell you more than anything that the demon of addiction no longer haunts my family, but I fear that it always will. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't worry about him, but I think that's to be expected. He is, after all, my baby brother. I am one of the lucky ones, however. I have been blessed with rewriting this story, this very story I'm telling you, over 10 times. So let me say that again. I have been blessed to be able to rewrite this story, my story, over 10 times since I started speaking four years ago. My brother has been in and out of his active addiction, has found recovery, and in turn, he found himself. Today, he is currently sober. 
And I have the honor and privilege of being able to share each and every one of these sober days with him in it. As I have had to change my story ending, I am blessed because my story hasn't ended. His story hasn't ended. It is just beginning. The disease of addiction does not have to end in death. If there is one thing I can leave you with tonight, please let it be that, that recovery is possible. Recovery is hard work, but it's so worth it. My brother is the uncle I always knew he could be. My son and brother fished all summer long last year, and it was the happiest moments of my son's life. He is so proud of his uncle, and it's something that I can't explain. They hold so much common interests, and he's an amazing role model for my child. My daughter, well, she and Uncle Lee, they have this bond. I swear you have to be a part of a secret society or something to hang out with them. He is one of the most important and influential men in her life, and I'm so thankful that, for that. I get a lot of uh, questions. The common question I get a lot is, so why does your brother fight so hard? After all, he's been through, put everyone through. Why does he stay on this earth and fight this demon? It's pretty simple. My brother has a kid. My nephew finally has his father back, and my parents have their son back. That picture there, that picture was taken um, the first time my brother ever spoke publicly about his addiction last summer. He had just gotten home from Arizona after my dad and I went down there, and we physically busted down the door of a drug house and uh, pulled him out of it. He was standing there alone on the stage in front of over 200 people, and I remember he broke down um, speaking about his addiction, his disease, his sobriety, what he had done to our family. And he was just sobbing, and he couldn't talk. And um, my dad, one of the strongest men I have ever come to know, walked through the crowd up onto that stage and surrounded my brother with kindness, understanding, and unconditional love. It was one of the most moving moments of my entire life. In me, I not only have my brother back, but one of my best friends. He's healthy, sober, happy. He currently works two full-time jobs. He's the marketing manager for Stop Heroin Now, and currently he's a leader in this epidemic against the heroin and opiate um, abuse. I love my brother. I do not love his addiction, but his addiction does not have to be what defines him, and I will fight this disease with him, and I hope that if you have a loved one that struggles with the disease of addiction, you will do the same. One in four adults struggling with the disease of addiction. Um, there's one in four adults that struggle with the disease of alcohol or drug addiction. That reality impacts one in three families and millions of family members. An estimated 38 million Americans or 15% of our population are chemically addicted to drugs, alcohol, or both. If each person struggling with the disease of addiction affects three family members, then 60% of our population is directly or indirectly affected by substance abuse. Like I said in the beginning, I'm a therapist that specializes in addiction, but I'll be the first to admit that I don't have all the answers. I do this job because I want to change the way this world views addiction. That view, though, however, needs to start with the leaders right here in Wisconsin, but it also can start with each of you. We need to fight for updated health curriculum classes, implementation of expert support groups for students that have loved ones struggling with addiction, and additional community follow-up with the greatest reach and impact for our youth. The time is right now. We are in the middle of an epidemic. If not now, when? We need more addiction services in our schools. We need peer-to-peer -peer recovery coaching programs. We need harm reduction, treatment, advocacy, education. We need a larger, more consistent base across the state. I could go on and on and on. We need to start focusing on saving lives, and that starts with educating our youth and each of you. How many more brothers, sisters, husband, wives, fathers, mothers, and children do we have to bury before action gets taken? Again, my name is Jessica Geschke from Stop Here, We're Now in Affiliated Clinical Services. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Jessica. Um, our community is truly blessed to have you as a part of it. Our next speaker, he uh, lost his brother to a heroin overdose, but he has become an inspiration as... He's made it a personal mission to find the good in his own tragedy so that we 
may have a difference made in our community so that we may learn from it. Tyler is currently the secretary for Stop Heroin Now and works for Hartford Joint Number 1 as an information systems technician while also attending UWWC to earn a degree in business administration. It is my privilege to present to you now Tyler Schramm. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Tyler. Um, I'm 19. I grew up right in Hartford. Uh, Washington County has been my home county for my entire life. Um, this is the first opportunity I've had to speak publicly about um, what happened to my family and I, but I feel very honored that I've been asked here today to help make a difference in our community, a uh, community I care so much about. As you said earlier, um, I'm currently an information systems technician for the Hartford School District. Um, however, today I'm not here to give you an advice on what, it, what electronic to purchase or to fix your computer or to recover the files that you refuse to back up 20 times. I'm here to discuss a much more serious topic that not only constantly harms our community, but has affected my family and I personally. The addiction epidemic in Wisconsin or Washington County alone is an astonishing issue that doesn't receive the attention it needs. Growing up, uh, my family was never a role model for others. We had our issues, we still do today, but we managed to work through them. Um, even in our hardest times, there's uh, one thing I always knew, it's that we loved and cared for each other. Uh, no matter what we could do, it could never be a great harm that would make us uh, turn against each other. However, the unfortunate case is, no matter what, it didn't matter because addiction doesn't know any boundaries. <clears throat> it, it doesn't care what race or ethnicity you are, uh, what your sexuality is, or problems you have, whether you grew up in a rich or poor household, uh, had the best grades, or what great achievements you accomplished. All it knows is to destroy your life and take those around, around you with it. <clears throat> um, it will find any possible weak point in a relationship and tear it right apart. Um, unfortunately, addiction has affected me more than one occasion, uh, more, than, um, more than one occasion in my life. Um, as said earlier, we lost my brother. On January 20, 23rd, 2016, at 4.31 p.m., my life changed forever. I received a text message that a sibling would never wish that they could get. I stared blankly at my phone in disbelief. I received a text message from my little sister saying that Jeremy wasn't breathing, breathing and the ambulance was there. I immediately ran to my car, sped through town, hoping to come home and realize that this was just a dream and everything was okay. As I hesitantly turned on my street, the street that my siblings and I grew up on and had fond memories, I saw our driveway blocked by EMTs and squad cars. My world froze. The EMTs police officers went in and out of the house with Ziploc bags of stuff, no pads, and it was just silent. I ran up to the house, greeted by an EMT who I'd never seen in my life before. He repeatedly asked who I was. Um, I couldn't even spit out my name because I was so confused on what was going on. It took him probably six or seven times to ask, him for, to ask me to calm down before he actually got my attention. He, uh, he told me to take a second to settle down and just to focus on him. At that moment, my life changed forever. He said that my brother didn't make it. Let me find my spot. I made my way into the house where I found my parents sitting in sorrow and shock. They were already being questioned by police officers and I could tell they were sitting in disbelief. Everything was so surreal. I immediately ran upstairs to find my little sister, where I found her in her room, in her room on her bed, curled up crying. I felt like a failure. I was the big brother that was supposed to keep her, keep her safe from the dark in this world. Sorry. Um, but I didn't, I failed. I could only ask myself, why, why wasn't I there to make the call? 
Why didn't I knock on Jeremy's room that day? Why didn't I prevent this from happening? But, of course, as many of us know, I couldn't prevent it. Jeremy had to know in his heart that he was going to recover, and it was his decision. And what hurt me the most is no matter what I did, I knew that I wouldn't be able to make my family smile because they were hurt so bad and nothing could relieve them of that pain. Um, the rest of the night was a blur. The officers gathered through Jeremy's room. The detectives questioned us. The EMTs packed up and left, and the coroner came to pick up Jeremy. The image of seeing a white Ziploc body bag sitting at the bottom of the stairs and having them carried out will never leave my mind. I watched them out the windows. They went to the car when realistically it didn't look anything more than a bag of garbage. But to me, that was my brother. The next few weeks were very hard. I was scared to go home because I was worried of seeing the first responders blocking the driveway. I was afraid that there would be strangers telling me someone didn't make it. I couldn't unsee the lifeless body laying at the bottom of the stairs in a bag. Using headphones or watching TV just wasn't an option. I, w I was afraid I wouldn't hear somebody call for help. Every little sound I heard made me jump out of my room to make sure that everyone was okay. My entire world was upside down. Unfortunately, that story did end in tragedy. We lost a beloved son, a brother, friend, cousin. Unfortunately, that's not the only thing I've had to deal with. Growing up, ever since I was in first grade, I had a dear friend of mine. Uh, we spent every time together. Their house became a second family to me when I was in my hardest time struggling with stuff at home. Unfortunately, as we became young teenagers, her life decided to take a turn. Her parents were getting a divorce. She was becoming lost and getting in the wrong age group. Soon enough, I found out that she was doing drugs. It broke my heart because she was the one person in my life that was a rock and I could go anything to, and now I felt like I was losing her. Unfortunately, it's been a long roller coaster of in and out of recovery, seeing different people, having her just disappear in weeks on end. Unfortunately, the story still goes on. Uh, she's still using, hasn't gone to recovery, hasn't seen her family in weeks. But I won't let those two stories tear me down. Today I can proudly say that I'm in a much better position along with my family. After countless weeks of moping around and trying to carry on, I decided to make a difference. I knew Jeremy wouldn't have wanted us to sit in sorrow for the rest of our lives. He would have wanted us to be successful and happy. Even though I knew what I wanted to do, I was still lost. I had such a big idea in my head, but was it even possible? Was I crazy to think that I, a small town tech, could make a, make a difference in a worldwide epidemic? Of course I was. Uh, I was crazy enough to take the leap of faith and, put, faith and put my all into helping the community I care so much about. The last thing I wanted to do was see another family struggle the way that we did. I soon, soon began my research online looking at different organizations in the area, um, many of which I saw that they did great work, but none of them really stuck out to me. It wasn't until I found a locally formed group, Stop Over Now, and I had met Jessica. Everything that I saw on their website, all the videos that I watched, and everything I heard from them just made me say, wow. I knew then that that's exactly what group I wanted to get into because they knew what they were doing and they could make a difference. Luckily, with their help, this year I was able to run my first benefit in memory of my brother along with my very supportive family and friends. We were able to raise $600 to put towards to put towards the cause. We'll be able to help somebody get into recovery and hopefully turn their life around so that they can become another inspiration for the rest of us. It's time that we stop having stories that come to an end. 
while that's everything in small detail, today I'm on a mission. I want to find the good in the tragedy and use it to make a difference in our community. I want to get drug, back, drug education back into our schools, churches, and other public forums in order to raise awareness. It's time, we take a, it's time we take a step forward and view the harm this epidemic is doing to our friends, family, and many of the beautiful souls that watch the street, walk the street. Let's join forces and get the addicts the recovery they strive, families the support, and community the knowledge. Together, we can be the solution. Uh, thank you, Tyler, and uh, thanks to all of our speakers here tonight, Holly, Carly, Jessica, and Tyler, for giving their time, and really, I commend all of your courage. It takes a lot to come up and bare your soul to everybody like this, not just to do that, but to take your tragedy and turn it into something good, it's something that can help those that have gone down that same path. Um, that concludes the evening for the time being, but like I said earlier, this is the second of a five-part lecture series. Um, the next night is going to be February the 9th, titled After the Bars Close, where you can hear from those struggling with addiction. February the 16th, uh, we will be, it will be called Celebrating Recovery and Legislation, Learning About the Legal Ramifications of Drug Abuse. And February the 23rd, a very interesting heroin simulation. Uh, some medical professionals will be coming in and uh, with some kind of medical doll where you will actually be able to see the effects that heroin has on the body and what exactly it does. I would also uh, urge you all to check out the Hidden in Plain Sight Bedroom exhibit. Just a uh, other side of the building over there. It's still open. It'll be open till 8 o'clock this evening. But, but uh, we'll be open all during this lecture series. In order to help our partners best serve the community, I would ask you all to complete an evaluation. Like I said earlier, you can find a questionnaire box right outside the door. It's to your right. You can write whatever you want, um, comments, questions for some of the speakers that maybe you don't feel comfortable saying out loud. Um, our speakers will also be out there if you would like a more personal conversation with them in regards to their own struggles. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Um, just the showing really says a lot about our community, that we won't let something like this stand and that we will make a difference because as it is now is currently unacceptable. Thank you. <laughs>